This is Make It Plain. Make It Plain. M I P. With my Samela Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Make It Plain. Get woke. God bless you. Get woke. Folks, MIP is now COVID free, meaning free to all subscribers as we navigate this pandemic. We're thinking about everyone and we've got to get through this together. So for a limited time, no fee to subscribe to make it plain on your favorite podcast app. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to welcome to Make It Plain right now, a state senator from Arkansas who is running for Congress now. She's been in the Arkansas State Legislature for a number of years. We want to hear all about it and her incredible story. Running for Congress from Arkansas is State Senator Joyce Elliott. Senator Elliott, how are you? I am doing well. You know, this is hard work. Anybody who says it's not, you know, it's not run the race fully. It's been such a, a journey during the pandemic, but I have to always remember everybody has the same handicap, so to speak. But, you know, you work hard and you get good news like we got over the weekend and you feel, you know, uh, more profoundly assured that this is something that we can do and that people are behind. So. And that good news is you are within one point of the yes. incumbent, correct? That's right. 1.5 points of, of, of the incumbent, and uh, which is virtually a tie, of course. Uh, but, you know, we are, we are in a red state where everybody keeps talking about it can't be done. I've actually called people, Mark, where people said, oh, it's, it's, it's Arkansas. I can't give you a contribution in Arkansas. You know, you can't, basically, you can't do that. Um, and so we just, just adopted the mantra like uh, many other people. Yeah, we are red state until we're not anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I've just had uh, the good fortune of having so many people step up to work on this campaign, which is a testament to our message of unity, unlike what we see at the national level, because our campaign is a reflection of all the different kinds of groups in our state. And that's a wonderful thing for us because uh, we can't win without doing that. Now, Arkansas is the only one of the old slave states that's never elected um, an African-American, the only one. And uh, in addition to being a good candidate, we have a chance to make history. And the type of groups that are behind us or the coalition of folks behind us make, makes that very possible. So, um, but, but Arkansas did elect the first black president, right? Well, some people said that. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be very thoughtful about that. <laughs> yeah, some people did indeed say that. Yeah, uh, and, and I have to say, you know, I, it's really interesting with Bill Clinton because uh, we both grew up in the southwestern part of the state. Uh, we were both born in the same area of the state, probably about 20, 25 miles apart in that little corner of Arkansas. Uh, but I kind of always knew I was black. That didn't have to be discovered. <laughs> that didn't have to be an announcement. It was clear. Would, would feel it. But, but it says something, though. You, I have to go back and just wonder what happened. Because you had an Arkansan and a Tennessean uh -huh. to the White House, mm -hmm. and it's like everything just flipped. So it seems to me if it was that way at one time, yes. what you're doing can't be that far-fetched. It is not that far-fetched. I think what people do so many times, Mark, when they see something that's changed, especially if they've not been used to, if they're not used to having to work hard for every little step they get to make, which is what I've had to do as a politician and, and, and largely even as a person growing up in the South. But Barack Obama happened is the major thing. And, and that is not an overstatement because, uh, you know, we had been a democratic state for, you know, over a hundred years or so. And when the Tea Party got started and, and uh, President Obama was in the White House, that's where the big switch came from. And so people need to think about this too. Well, if it switched after President Obama was, uh, was in the White House, you know, he went to the White House in 2008. Mm -hmm. You know, that's only 12 years ago. So one of the other advantages we have is that we have not been read that long. So it's not as deeply read as people tend to think. 
you just have to believe in it enough to go like, no, we can change this. And you know, that's that's what I'm stepping up to do. You know, Marvin often preached the same sermon about how Obama was a, another reconstruction, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm not sure, come to think of it, during reconstruction, were there any Arkansans in Congress with any black Arkansans? And I uh, know there were there were some though in the in the House and Senate, but not but uh, not in Congress. Yeah, and but Arkansas, you know, Arkansas is kind of on the cusp of Midwest and South, mm -hmm. and uh, part of Arkansas is hills, the Ozarks, and so forth. And so there are there's a wide swath of Arkansas that was people didn't have slaves; all they could do they had just had rocks. So because of that, Arkansas has really not ever been, even as, a, as when it was a democratic state, not a deeply divided state by politics. Um, and so this, this has been kind of a natural thing for us to come back together when we clearly see now. That's the kind of folks I'm attracting. We say, okay, we've never been like this. We can do better than that. We just need somebody to show us that it's possible. And I'm not giving myself all that credit. I'm just the conduit. But my whole life has been that way. I, I integrated to school when I was 15 years old. That was tough. And, um, and I learned. What school, what school did you integrate? I, I was not in Little Rock. I grew up in South Arkansas in a little bitty school. Uh, it was Willisville High School. Tiny little school. So tiny. Mark, I mean, there were nine people in my graduating class. So there was no place to get lost or to hide. You were always somebody's target because there was nowhere to go. And so um, that's part of the time, you know, I learned that public service really could play a, a, a positive role because I began to realize it was through somebody supposedly public service that we were divided, that uh, we had kids who didn't like each other, who didn't know any better. Somebody taught us all that stuff. And I decided that um, I am, despite everything, I'm, I'm going to put my roots down right here in Arkansas. And that's why I've remained in Arkansas. I'm going to put my roots down right here in the South because the blood, sweat, and tears of my ancestors are in this red dirt where I grew up. So I, I stayed here, and I've been committed through public service to make the change, and I've not been sorry about that. It's just worked out well. Well, clearly you haven't, and you haven't been sorry about that. So now you integrated that little high school. Yes, along with my sister. Yeah, my sister was the first African-American there to graduate from that school. I was one year behind her. But it was, it was this thing people call freedom of choice. You know, people don't understand the history behind choice sometimes. And so it was my family, about four or five others. And at, at, so we were there just to integrate the school, uh, de facto integrate it. But at the uh, at semester, we were all called together and told we could go back to our black school. Uh, and they expected us to do so. That was the first time I took a hard stand mark on something that scared me because uh, out of the blue, I just said, I just, something just came over me. I was 15 and I just knew there was something wrong with so somebody wanted to send me back. So mm. I just worded up, I'm not going. And I went, I got hot all over. <laughs> but, okay, is anybody staying with me? <laughs> and sure enough, the other families did not, but luckily my brother and sisters did. So we were there, we were the ones who were left there to take a stand. Well, it's always important to hear these stories. And of course, we've all heard the story of Little Rock. But yes. it's good to hear your story as well. And I can imagine whenever that happened in small, not so prominent places with a lot of media coverage. Yes. It took a little more heat because it wasn't as much light shown upon your situation. Whereas That's Little Rock, right. the world was watching, you know. Yes. Yeah. Your situation, that, that must have been pretty harrowing to do if there was not a lot of light shown on it. It was, and I, I keep saying, and I should have done it already, I'm going to write a book one day called There Were No Cameras <laughs> because that was the case. But what it did do for me, though, I got a lot of good out of it, you know, that's led me, that's, you know, informed my life because because of teachers, I had teachers at the all black school who thought I was all that and I could do anything and, and respected me. Uh, but I did not have those same teachers when we changed schools. And, but it did, it did cement to me this need to be the kind of teacher that I did not have, and which is one of the major reasons I became a teacher. And one of the major reasons um, when I first taught, despite a lot of opportunities, I chose to teach in a school 
where there were black and white kids, but they did not have a, a black teacher in that school. Wow. Uh, there was one teacher who taught there, I think maybe an hour a day, and then there was a coach who was there. But when I showed up with my big fro and my skirt, I was trying to pull down because it was mini skirt time <laughs> and looked like a teacher. Um, you know, I was there to be a role model for white kids as well as black kids because the thing I learned is the white kids in a lot of ways were victims just as much as the black kids in a different kind of way because they had to live in this world. And I thought, I'm going to be that teacher. And that's been the through line of my life to try to bring people together. So, Senator, you integrated a school as a student and then integrated a school as a teacher. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yes. So what happened? Yeah. Where, where'd you go to where'd you go to college i went to college in, in arkansas to a state southern arkansas university and there a whole story behind that real quickly is that you know i it was not where i thought i was going to go initially but since i had decided that i was going to stay right here and make change right here i basically was part of integrating that college as well because i thought why go i had an uncle who would offer to pay everything if i'd come to michigan and go to school because he was a military guy, World War II, who came back and hated the South and wanted, just wanted me to leave. And I thought, no, I'm going to do this right here. And so my class in, in the year that I started was, was the largest African-American class that had gone to that school. And that was not all that large. Wow. <laughs> Amazing story. So how long, are you still teaching? I'm not still teaching. I taught for 30 years. I started, I started teaching in 1973. Mm -hmm. um, and so I taught for 30 years. And uh, when I was still teaching, um, when I re first ran for office, and because um, Arkansas had the setup to where we met every other year for a session. And so, and I didn't have the money to just say, I'm leaving the classroom and go be a legislator. So I had some overlap there for about three years. And when I became chair of the education committee, uh, it just, I had so many responsibilities, I had to make a choice. But by then, I'd been teaching for 30 years. So let's go back to something you said earlier. Some folks said to you, they can't give you money because you're in a red state. Do yeah. some of those folks include the DCCC? Are they helping you? Yes, they are. I know it, it's been an interesting thing because um, I, I ran, by the way, in 2010 when a lot of other Democrats ran and nobody won. So, but I, I didn't get that kind of help in 2010. Okay. Right after, but um, the DCCC has been incredibly uh, uh, supportive in in this campaign, um, and you know, they were anxious and, and excited that I'm running. Uh, and I, I and I give them credit for understanding that you know this is a time that a black woman. Could, the black woman can win. The black woman can is a good candidate, and um, so it's a completely different story from experiences that I you know I, I that I know have happened before. So I hear you, <laughs> but I, I need to give credit where credits due. They're being very helpful to this campaign. I'm 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 glad to hear that, that they are uh, supporting you. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned some of the overlap between teaching and the legislating. You. Mm -hmm. Living in Arkansas too, I'm I'm told from your story. Yes. You know yes. What it's like to be a working class person uh -huh. living from Absolutely. paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. about that and how common that is amongst everyday Arkansans. Yeah. It is very common uh, because people were struggling before the pandemic. And and, and so you you know how much that's exacerbated things. But I grew up, um, you know, my, my mom and dad split. We were living in Michigan when I first knew I was a kid, but I had been born in Arkansas and they'd moved there where the other uncle was. Um, but when we moved back to Arkansas, they were split and we moved in with my grandparents. And that was into a, that was a four room house and that included the kitchen. So that <laughs> included the kitchen and, and an outhouse. And, and, but it was not anything that unusual. Uh, and so we were poor growing up. This is no, there's no two ways to, about it. Uh, but we had to figure out a way to make things work. And when I got ready to go to college, you know, I had to figure out how to, my school didn't have a counselor. I had to figure out how to get uh, support through grants and loans and work study uh, myself. But I figured it out. Uh, 
and I know that struggle of trying to do that and not having those role models to say, this is how you do it or that's how you do it. So my first year, my second year of teaching, I got married by then and my husband had a, a fellowship at University of South Florida. Well, he had been in education, so had I. We ate beanie weenies for a whole summer because we, uh, he was in school. I was um, out of school by then and we weren't getting paid in the summertime. I got a job working at a youth hostel and, the, and they let us have a room without rent to uh, live at that youth hostel. And, and you can make beanie weenies go a long way <laughs> on a hot plate. But it's been good for me in recognizing when, when people struggle, I understand what that means of not having health insurance, you know, uh, of, of, of being empathetic as a contrast to my opponent, you know, who grew up well to do and still seems to be very, uh, unempathetic or even sympathetic about the way people struggle. Uh, he's voted, I don't know, 13 times or more about to repeal the Affordable Health Care Act. And um, he looks out, he does a good job of looking out for the wealthy in Congress, I'll tell you that. He's probably Wall Street's favorite person. Um, special interest is his thing, you know, and people's interest is my thing. So, you know, you, there's a clear choice here, and uh, I'm making sure people know what that is. So, just to be clear, Arkansas did not expand Medicaid, correct? No, uh, Arkansas, no, this is a good story. Arkansas was the first southern state to expand uh, Medicaid. Well, they did. Uh, so, okay. yeah, yeah, and added, uh, you know, added 300,000 people, you know, to the roles of having health care. Um, we had, at the time, we had a Democratic governor, so we've not, we've not been read as long as people think. We had a Democratic governor, but we had um, we had a House that was still barely Democratic, if I'm remembering correctly. But in the Senate, where I was, uh, we had a, a Senate that was dominated by Republicans. But, so we had to pass it, obviously, on both ends. And in the Senate, it's where we really had to work hard to work together so that people could get health insurance. And uh, it's, it's been quite successful. It's, it's gotten some uh, attacks by our now current um, Republican governor, but it's lasted just the same. And I, I think everybody, everybody has benefited from having that. So uh, what, how, what is the COVID situation in mm -hmm. Arkansas right now? We have just in the last two or three days uh, become what, what's called one of the red states because we have not had, uh, we've not had a solid plan kind of like, you know, nationally where uh, people have come together and said, um, there's not been a call for us to say, let's take some public responsibility. Um, and we have struggled with our numbers fluctuating uh, up and down. But lately, the numbers have really gone up. And yesterday, they started to come down again. And in a small state, um, you know, where we got um, relief uh, from the federal government, we got the third lowest relief funding per worker of any state in the United States, even though my opponent is one of the persons uh, that's on the oversight committee, whatever they call it, you know, for those funds. But it has hit us hard. And a lot of it is because people are, you know, I, I think following the national lead have not taken seriously what we all need to do for one another. We've started school uh, and uh, that's been a real problem for many for many uh, schools. And right here in my district, you know, there are schools that are going to be closing because they got started, and now they have to. Uh, things have gotten out of hand, so it's been a hardship for us, very much so. So, aside, Senator Elliott, from COVID and healthcare, what are some of the other issues that our uh, kids will be yeah. voting on come November? Uh -huh. A big thing for us is infrastructure, and I think that's true across the country too. But and 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 this, I just think about schools restarting. The infrastructure problem, you know, was that that was on blast again. Of kids, families, families who thought they were well connected realized that they did not have all the broadband uh, with the bro that they needed, even to have their kids at home and be on several devices. And people who thought they were above that found out they really weren't. So, I mean, that's a large part of our infrastructure issue, but it's also true about the roads and bridges and the safety of it all. And, and the other issues, you know, we here in Arkansas struggle with um, the, 
justice issues like everybody else across the country that have been brought to the, you know, to the fore. And uh, we have a lot of young people, but are people across the board. Uh, that's another thing that's been as bad as it was to have to be in the street about the Black Lives Matter movement. I've seen people from all different backgrounds come together, you know, to fight for a common good. I often think if we had the same kind of uh, attitude uh, toward the pandemic that we've had toward, you know, coming together over the Black Lives Matter movement, we would be much better off when it comes to the pandemic. So maybe out of that, we can learn some of those things, uh, you know, on the going forward. But and, and I think the other thing that I mean, education is, a, is an issue outside of the pandemic, because one of the things I think every kid deserves is not just an adequate education, but a world class education system. When I was first in the in the house, one of the things we did, we did not have a pre-K program. I was a part of our creating a pre-K program that was number one in the nation for several years. And then like so many things, you know, we quit funding things as we should and we let them backslide. But we know what we need to do for all kids to have a, to have a, a good shot from the beginning. Um, and we need to get back to those kind of things and away from so much of that division. Because I, I study countries who are called the highest performing countries in the world. And they are doing, Mark, what's interesting, so many of the things that we started out doing in the United States, but we have stopped. And they look at us and go, we learned this from you, so why did you stop doing this? <laughs> you know, it is, it's kind of like a no-brainer. They highly respect our educational professionals in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Black Lives Matter. Have there been, has there been Black Lives Matter activity and demonstrations in Arkansas? Oh, yes. Yeah. My, my district is, uh, includes all of Little Rock and, and North Little Rock, that, the urban area. Uh, so we, uh, so we saw it first here, and that was to be expected. But the, the rest of the district is the, you know, the outer county is very rural. And one of those counties is, is, is a white county. That's the name of the county. I'm not talking about the people who are in it. It's white county's name of it. But it's predominantly, you know, it, it's predominantly a, 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 a Caucasian folks who live there, known predominantly as being very uh, conservative. But I was actually invited to a Black Lives Matter rally in that county. Things have changed so much. It I mean, the, it's changed a lot of things here around us. And uh, I attended, I couldn't be as involved in the rallies even here in Little Rock as I wanted to because I'm a kidney donor. And that's, you know, I have to try to protect that one I still have left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we had to figure out different ways I could be involved, like getting back to the pickup truck and, you know, talking from the truck. But, uh, you know, in a, another county, a larger county to the south of where I live now, Saline County, same thing happened there with the Black Lives Matter movement. So uh, I, I wish people would get to, um, some people need to get to know Arkansas better. And that includes some people right in Arkansas. Because a lot of people, especially younger people, and um, those who just want a more um, inclusive world, are changing our state right around people who keep insisting it's the same. Well, it's not. Because when you when you have the kind of uh, the, the kind of activity we had during the Black Lives Matter movement, things are very very different. So we have lots of people who moved here from other places as well. That's good to know. So, State Senator Joyce Elliott, what do you need to win? Do you know in terms of, of numbers? Uh -huh. I talked about why I said I spoke to um, uh, Mike Espy in Mississippi. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And if you heard the little he needs to win in Mississippi, uh -huh. Mississippi, like Arkansas, Mississippi hadn't elected anyone since Reconstruction to the Senate. And uh -huh. it seems these margins are so small. If we could just get yeah. out, get our folk out, I know you'd have it. That, that's, that, well, that's exactly right. Because, um, for example, I'm an educator. Uh, you know, one in 10 donors uh, that have given to me are, uh, you know, work in education. If, if I could just think about, if just educators could turn out, would turn out, I, I would win this race. It is also the case that if there are so many people who have not voted, if we could get, I say, about three for three to six percent more of the folks who have not been voting, I would win this race. Mm -hmm. And so it is very, very doable. 
And um, right now, what that poll showed that I mentioned early on, uh, the folks that are now, quote unquote, gettable, who not only 6% have not made up their minds. I mean, we are like at 46 and 47%, my opponent and I, was 6% whose minds have not been made up. That 6% is made up of people from like ages 18 to 44. That's, those are the people that I attract. So we know that we need to, to go after these, you know, these targeted groups. And, uh, and, and we're doing that. And, and we're not taking anything for granted. And the other thing I need, yeah, people out there, it might, you might not like it, but you can't win races without money. So you can go to JoyceElliott.com, www.JoyceElliott.com and make a contribution. It doesn't matter how small it is. Because right now, Mark, I'm so happy. I have contributions from every state in this, in, you know, in our country, all 50 states, from Puerto Rico, from the Virgin Islands, from Guam, and someplace else I'm probably forgetting. And most of those are small donations. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you have been, as my grandpa would say, blessed in the pocket, <laughs> um, you can contribute $2,800. That's the max. If you can do that, do it, because what we're doing here in Arkansas matters. And when we talk about representation matters, it matters that only 4% of African-American women are in the Congress, 4%. And we make up about 8% of the whole population in the country. And so the reputation, the, the representation greatly needs to be enhanced and not could be a part of that. 8% of the whole population, but about 150% of political influence these days when it comes to black women. So it's yeah. really disproportionate on that level. Okay, so let me ask this. Mm -hmm. What about, Lord have mercy, uh, mail-in balloting in Arkansas? Y'all good or was that gonna be some drama too? Oh, it, well, it, it, it was, it's been drama. Yeah. About that. I have a proposal because we, we, we don't have in our state no excuse absentee voting. So I offered a proposal to get that changed and of course it, the Republicans voted it down. But we kept the light on it so much the governor finally did issue uh, finally did issue an executive order to say we could have no excuse voting except just to say the pandemic, you know, that kind of thing. But we do at this point, though, the Republican Party, especially right here in my county where I live, is, is giving the um, county clerk all kinds of problems about uh, the, the mail-in ballots, you know, just throwing up, you know, red flags and causing a problem. But, you know, uh, when are we going to open them? Uh, how many can you take? Or when are they going to be mailed back? You know, the, those kind of things. So what we have to do, probably like a lot of people, Mark, is just be absolutely diligent about making sure people know all, the, not only just how to do it, but what to anticipate where people are, will keep you from trying to do it. So I have put a video where I show line by line <laughs> how to fill out your absentee ballot request. So we have to do all of that work of educating people. Now, do when do ballots go out? How early can people get ballots and vote in Arkansas? Well, we will start voting on the night. We, they can already get, they can already uh, request ballots. Okay. And we will, start, we will start voting on the 19th of October. So oh. that, that, uh, and that includes um, early, but we have an early voting um, too, like two weeks prior to the, uh, prior to the, the um, election itself. But I've already requested, I've already requested a, a, a ballot. I haven't seen it yet in the mail. I keep looking for it. But if I don't get it soon, I'm going to walk down to the office and do some talking about this. So well, I'm <laughs> sure, you are. I'm sure yeah. you, are. you are amazing. It's so nice to meet you and really excited about your race. Wishing you all the luck in yeah. the world. How long has your opponent been in office? Uh, he was elected and he's in his third term. So uh, that's five years, well, six years, actually, one on six years. Yeah, yeah. Well, folks, we got to keep pushing, and we have to be sure that Joyce Elliott is elected to Congress in Arkansas. Go to JoyceElliott.com. Everyone, ma'am, please, ma'am, please, sir, let all your friends and relatives know. Send her a few dollars, too, uh, uh -huh. if you know, for this campaign so we can try to make this happen. Very important.
that we could push Elliot on Capitol Hill. And thank you for having me on. I, I catch you every time you're on somebody's show on TV, <laughs> MSNBC. Oh. <laughs> we've, got you, we've got you down in Arkansas. <laughs> so, bless, absolutely. bless your heart. I appreciate that. You keep up the good work. Maybe we'll talk again before Election Day. I love that. All our luck in the world. We wish you all the luck we can, okay? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. God, you are our refuge. Send our ancestors to guard our doors. Cast out this virus from our communities and our bodies. Heal, bless, and protect everyone listening and their loved ones. Thank you for listening to Make It Plain and Get Woke. Remember to listen, like, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. If all minds are clear, it has been Made Plain. Made Plain.